Good afternoon, everyone. Can you hear me okay? Is the mic working? Great. Um, welcome to this afternoon's uh, industry talk, SVOD and the Battle for European Content. Um, that title kind of frightens me a little bit, um, that we're in some kind of war, and I know it's difficult for, for producers and filmmakers out there, but hopefully today's uh, session will um, help illuminate some of the trends that we're seeing uh, as this marketplace shifts. Um, I am I'm old enough to remember the days when I was at POV as a commissioning editor there, when uh, Ted Sarandos, uh, who's the chief content officer at Netflix, would come by our kind of humble little office there and order 1,500 DVDs of that film and 500 of this film um, for their uh, new venture of uh, DVD by mail, which we were all very skeptical of at the time. Um, uh, times have changed a little bit since then. And times are changing a lot um, over, over the next uh, uh, year or so. Um, uh, Netflix, which has been the dominant player in the SVOD market, is increasingly being challenged. Um, uh, not only Amazon and Hulu, but uh, the recent launch of Disney+, Plus, um, Apple um, coming into the, the space, uh, Peacock is launching, um, HBO Max will launch in 2020. Um, a new, brand new service, you know, focusing on short form, Quibi will be launching also in the springtime. So we're really going to see some kind of seismic shifts in the, in the marketplace. And that's all going to affect, obviously, how we all go about our, our work. Um, so I'm excited that we have um, uh, someone who really knows this space very well uh, and can help guide us as to the, the, the trends that we have seen and perhaps what we will see moving forward. So um, please welcome our, our speaker, um, Guy Bisson from Emperor Analysis, who's going to give us a, a presentation. Before Guy comes up, I have a little bit of homework for you as we get into this session. Um, I'm going to ask Guy some questions once he finishes his presentation, but we're also going to open up for you. So please um, be thinking of how all of this impacts your work and what kind of questions you will have um, as we move into, the, move into the future. And we'll have a roving mic so that you can uh, participate in this conversation too. So please welcome uh, from Emperor Analysis, Guy Bisson. Guy? Thank you, Simon. Good afternoon, everyone. So my name is Guy Bisson. I'm one of the founders of Ampere Analysis. Um, we are a London-based firm of entertainment industry analysts. Basically, we do data. Um, let me say up front, I know people like to take photos of the slides. Um, you're welcome to. My best side is my left side. But it's much easier just to send me an email at the end and I will happily share the deck with anyone who wants it. My email is on the last slide. Um, so Ampere Analysis, as I said, we're London-based but globally in Outlook. Um, we work with uh, large studios, with large channel groups and broadcasters, with regulators, with investment banks, with telecoms companies and with distributors. And we provide data in six different verticals. Fundamentally, we look at consumer behavior in detail across multiple markets. What, what do people want? What are their hopes, dreams, and desires? How are they engaging with television? We track content title by title in the streaming space, and we do the good old traditional company KPIs, the sort of thing I grew up doing, forecasting revenues and subscribers. What I'm going to do for you today is use some of that data to try and paint a picture of what's happening out there in TV industry, but more specifically, what it means for documentary and factual content in particular, and where some of the opportunities may lie. Let me start with a bit of scene setting. So one of the questions we get asked quite often is why the obsession with streaming? Because if you plot a pie chart, an analyst favorite, and you look at the money in the industry as a whole, from the cinema window forward, um, what it will tell you is that streaming accounts for about 10% of the global entertainment industry revenue today, just 10%. So why is everyone so focused on the streaming market when the money apparently is elsewhere? 
Well, now I have two graphs to try and explain that. One is this one, which shows that traditional paid-for television is flat, but note still bigger than streaming on a unique basis. This is a household basis, but of course people take multiple SVOD services. More on that later. But the really important chart is this one, and that is traditional paid television growth on the left bar, which you can barely see, and streaming television growth on the right bar. And companies have a tendency to chase growth, and all of the growth in the industry is coming from online and streaming at the moment. And that is the reason for the focus. Now, we're all aware of Netflix and Amazon and a few other regional services, but of course we are on the eve of four very high-profile rollouts. Um, Disney and Apple already started, but we have HBO Max from Warner Media rolling out Q1 next year, and Peacock from NBC Universal for very significant direct-to-consumer plays from the people who make and own the content. And that is a fundamental shift, one of the biggest fundamental shifts in the last 120 years of the entertainment industry, cutting out the middleman potentially altogether, holding back content from the traditional distribution and licensing partners. And of course, impacting the competitive landscape and the consumer choice and opportunity. Content has again risen to the fore, and I won't be so glib as to say content is king, but it absolutely is central now to positioning within the industry, because it allows different streaming services and different operators to differentiate from one another. And one can differentiate in a non-linear space without going across multiple brands as we used to have to do in the days of linear television. You can do it through curation of content on a single platform. But there are a number of factors impacting that content offer today. Um, one of them, particularly in Europe, of course, is regulatory change. Increased competition is impacting leading to viewer fragmentation, something we've dealt with many times in the past. We have an evolving demographic mix in the streaming space. We have a potential impending and very significant studio licensing challenge, that is the holdback of content by the major content producers. And of course, we have a market that is globalizing in a way that it never has before. The um, entertainment industry, particularly around licensing and content, has traditionally been very geographically limited and segmented, and those geographic walls are increasingly disappearing and breaking down. So I'm going to talk about each of these and how it impacts documentary in particular. First of all, quotas. So nominally, the 30% impending quota on streaming services for content of European origin is a boon for producers. Um, depending on which platform and which country, um, it's up to several thousand hours of content is required for those streaming platforms to reach quota. So Netflix, Amazon, in many countries needing three, four, five, six thousand hours. This is all content, not just documentary. However, when you look at Netflix across the region, and you look at a unique title count, or a unique title hours, 26% of its titles are already European. 21% um, when we think about hours. Now, where's the, where's the mismatch there? Well, of course, it's about geographic licensing. So because European content is less likely to be pan-regionally licensed. It doesn't quite add up to those figures that you drill down to at a country by country level. And so what does that tell you? Simply by expanding the reach of their contracts with European producers, the geographic licensing, they can begin to build up that quota requirement without buying any more content. 
So drilling down just into documentary, um, documentary as a, as a percent of catalogue across most of the streaming players, and of course it varies, but it's around 8 or 9, 10% at most. And so if we can work out, assuming they maintain the rel relative mix of their catalogue, uh, the hours of documentary required, and you can see here it varies from a few tens of hours to a few hundreds of hours. So that is specifically the demand for doc the likely demand for documentary as a result of quotas. And of course, note that the local European platforms like Maxdome, Infinity, etc., in Italy, uh, are already at quota, and that is uh, common across um, geographies that the local players, of course, are leading the local content push. Drilling down just into Netflix then as a case study, this is the, the little circles are the, are the percent of content that is European at the moment uh, within each country. And you can see it ranges from around 15 to 20%. And it's been incredibly consistent so there hasn't been a particular recent upswing in European content. Over the several halves back to 2015, it's been pretty flat. Drop in August, um, that's probably due to a major contract that uh, has expired and yet to be renewed. It's not a significant drop or a, or a directional trend in terms of European content. Globally, around 8% of um, content on Netflix is documentary. And interestingly, half of the documentary content on Netflix is globally licensed. So um, half of the content is on a major, on a large pan European license. And much of that content is coming from independence, as we're going to see in a minute. So if we do the sums on the 8% and the size of the catalogue, which of course varies by country, what you can see is that there's an amazingly consistent requirement to meet quota in each country. In fact, regardless of catalogue size, it averages out around 255 hours per country. But remember, it could be the same 255 hours, just licensed pan regionally, and then they would meet requirement in each country. So you can't sum all of those very attractive numbers and come up with a much larger demand for documentary, unfortunately. Although it's, it's not quite as simple as that because it, of course, won't all be uh, regionally licensed. So let's try and calculate not just for Netflix, but for all of the European platforms, streaming platforms, what the impact of quota might be on documentary. And it's very difficult to do because of each of the licenses will be for different countries, um, for different baskets of content across different platforms, and the demand and requirement varies by platform as well. So all we can do is put broad numbers on it, extremes, and, of course, the reality will lie somewhere in the middle. So at one extreme, it could be around 500 hours if everything was pan-regionally licensed. At the other extreme, it could be 8,000 hours if everything was done country by country, platform by platform. The reality is that it's probably between the 400 and the 4,000, call it about 2,000 hours. That is across 80 different platform country combinations of streaming service. So trying to size the entire European impact of quotas. So while the quota is important, and it is a boon for producers, particularly European producers, it may not shift the dial to quite the extent that some of the top line numbers might otherwise suggest. Um, so other market factors may actually be more important. Let's drill down and have a look at what some of those may be. Demographics. So this one is important, and this one, I would say, has legs. Um, think about streaming, and think about Netflix, and think about who you think of as a Netflix customer. 
And the pie chart on the left shows you probably what you're thinking of as the typical Netflix customer. More than 40% of their customers are millennials. They're under 35. So they skew for a customer base, no surprise to anyone, to the younger demographic. But the interesting graph, of course, is the graph on the right, the bar chart, which shows where the growth in customer base is coming from. And you can see very clearly that the biggest growth category among streaming customers is 45 to 54 year olds, and the second biggest is 55 to 64 year olds. So strong growth coming from the much, much older demographic for streaming. When those older people um, have a streaming service, once they've taken the plunge, they watch almost as much streaming content as the young, younger demographics and the younger population. So once they've got it, they're major streaming consumers. And of course, their content preferences are very, very different from those younger millennials. This is a skew towards favorite genre for the 45 to 64 age category. It's not every genre category, I just picked out a few extreme skews and what you can see is they're much more likely to like crime and thriller, particularly dramas. They're much more likely to like documentary and they're much more likely, of course, to like news and current affairs. And that is impacting the way that the streaming players are approaching the market in terms of their content acquisition and, of course, their own production. What this graph is showing is the global change in the, the genre mix of all streaming platforms globally, first half 2019 versus first half 2018. And you can see that there's been a consistent uplift in uh, documentary in particular. A couple of other genres, and they're more for the younger demographic, reality and light entertainment, which were not strong genre categories for the streaming players until very recently. So they are diversifying at both ends of the scale, but they're increasingly looking at period drama, at crime drama, at crime procedural, and at documentary and factual content. And that is, of course, a positive of that demographic shift which will only continue. Streamers as well, so let's say that Netflix and Amazon's own original production is also beginning to change. And we can see shifts, for example, away from sci-fi a bit, away from comedy a bit, towards period drama, things like The Crown being a classic example. But we can also see that they're actively commissioning documentary content we track um, titles in development and production to try and give us a view a year or two into the future. And this is um, the forward or the, the documentary that's currently in production or development from the two major global streamers. And what you can see is that there are two very standout categories in terms of what they're commissioning, um, crime documentary and sport documentary. Sport in particular is a focus of Amazon. Both platforms are heavily investing in crime documentary. So not just acquisition, but production opportunity as well coming from those streaming players. Increased direct competition is another factor that has created a major market shift. So if we look at the biggest buyers of documentary now globally, or oh sorry, this is in Europe, the top two are streaming players, Netflix and Amazon. The next three are also streaming players, Now TV, that's Sky's streaming platform, Maxdome in Germany, Viaplay and Seymour in Scandinavia. And you can see that a number of other streamers are heavily invested in documentary as well. And what about the nearest of the new? 
So Netflix and Amazon, they're on the same scale. Their documentary is relatively low, the percentage of documentary which is in the circle. But look at Quibi, that's Jeffrey Katzenberg's new short form platform. Look at Facebook, even Disney Plus, which we don't think of particularly as a driver for documentary, um, and YouTube, of course, around the third of their commissioning going forward is documentary content, documentary and news content. So new players are significant drivers of an uplift in demand and interest for documentary content. What about the studio licensing challenge? So remember on my um, bubble graph showing all of the influences on content, on licensing, and having a knock-on effect, of course, on documentary. How does the studios going direct impact this industry? Well, nominally, if we've got the major content producers and owners removing their content in large scale from streaming platforms that they don't themselves own, it, of course, has a huge knock-on nominally beneficial effect on independent producers because suddenly they become the most important suppliers. Their relative importance rises up significantly compared to the major studios. Let's look at Netflix's catalogue and this is drilling down just into the three majors that we know are imminently launching direct, Disney, Warner Media, of course, including HBO and uh, NBC Universal. And that in the bubble is the percent of content that they are supplying to Netflix in each of those countries. So you can see that around 20% of Netflix's entire catalog is exposed to licensing risk from these direct to consumer studio launches. Unfortunately, those studios are not major suppliers of documentary. So the licensing risk to Netflix does not massively impact documentary content. In fact, only a few percent of uh, hours of content is coming from those major studios. Other genres massively potentially impacted, up to 20% for sci-fi, um, 16, 17% for crime, and nearly 15% for children's content. So for independent producers as a whole, huge potential opportunity from the studios pulling back, just not for documentary. Globalization is another major impact, and it's a huge shift not to be underestimated, and completely new, as I said at the beginning, to the way that the industry works and the way that we think about licensing uh, and content production. We've been tracking for a long time, and again, this is looking at upcoming titles, so none of the titles in this analysis have actually been on platform yet, or aired anywhere. They're being made at the moment, or in development at the moment. And we've seen for about the last 18 months that the majority of Netflix's original production is not being made in the US. It's being made across a diverse array of international markets. Another fundamental shift as a result of globalization. Documentary is going that way as well, although still the majority, 57%, is US made. And it's much less diverse at the moment in terms of where Netflix is commissioning original documentary. Just a handful of markets compared to the whole pie that includes drama and other forms of content, the big pie on the right. But globalization, an ongoing trend. In terms of local documentary on streaming platforms, only in markets where there is a strong broadcast-led streaming player are we seeing large amounts of local documentary on the streaming platforms in that country. So Germany with Maxstone, which of course is a, a, pro, a pro Sieben owned platform, 
uh, the UK with Sky's Now TV, etc., relatively large amounts of local documentary. Other countries still mainly getting it from outside of their home market. So if we accept that globalization is a fact, that globalization is an opportunity for non-US producers, that the role of independence is going to ascend in importance, and that Netflix is increasingly commissioning documentary and other forms of content outside of its home market, then where next for Netflix original production? Where are the next hot markets in terms of production? Now this is all content, not just documentary, but of course documentary potentially a part of it. So what we did was a very sim simple correlation. <coughs> we looked at current on-platform original titles, added them to the future ones that we can see that they're making, and correlated it against simply the gross number of subscribers in a market. So simply this market is bigger than this one, and guess what? The bigger the market, the more local production. Bleeding obvious, you may say, but it's rare that you get a correlation um, this strong in real-world data. And so we can potentially use that to be predictive and say, let's look at the top 30 largest Netflix markets globally and then compare that to how many titles they've made of original production. And you can see that there's a, a decent relationship. Some markets look a bit underweight. So Germany, relative to its size, looks a bit underweight in terms of original production. Thus, one would expect more in Germany. Australia, relative to its importance, looks underweight, so we would expect more there. Some markets are overweight, and there are reasons for that. India looks overweight relative to its size, but that is because Netflix sees a massive future potential in the Indian market. Spanish-speaking Latin markets are overweight, but that is because Spanish content works well in the US and other international markets as well. And the next 10 markets for focus are the ones to the left of the axis. So places like Turkey, like Poland, like Russia, like Chile. And then there are other markets beyond that where we would expect to see um, production begin to ramp up. So who is commissioning documentary? Well, if we look broadly at a, a simple split, broadcast players versus streaming players. And again, this is looking at upcoming titles. Nominally, they're the same. They're both um, at about 30% unscripted content. That is all unscripted, not just documentary unscripted. But there are very distinct differences between the different groupings within that. So US broadcasters, relatively little unscripted commissioning. European broadcasters are major commissioners of unscripted content. SVOD service services around a quarter, but look at the social video players and how much of their content is um, unscripted. So that's the Facebook, the YouTube, the Snapchats and how much of a potential driver they are going forward, just beginning as they are really on their content journey. And drilling down into documentary specifically, you can see who's very much focused on it. So Quibi stands out again, Disney, um, Snapchat less so, a lot of their unscripted is unscripted reality rather than documentary, but a big commissioner of unscripted. And then you have the obvious players like Discovery, the BBC, etc. And drilling down into the top 20 commissioners of documentary content globally, you can see that there is a holy trinity of commissioners. So who are the big, big commissioners? The <coughs> public broadcasters, particularly the European public broadcasters, um, the new streaming players, big drivers, and of course, 
the documentary specialists, the discoveries, the Smithsonian's, the PBS's, the curiosity streams of this world. And finally then, just a few slides on what is selling at the moment. Um, so we track, um, as I said, all upcoming titles. Within that, we track uh, 579 documentary projects we can see currently in development. And you can see that broadly the key genres are nature, history, and crime. And then there's a few other smaller categories that stand out. Travel is an obvious one. Politics is becoming increasingly interesting. Biography, medical, and sport, we mentioned earlier, driven in particular by platforms like Amazon. So of the 1,284 unscripted projects we've got in our database, around half of those are documentary. And one of the things we also track is what they're actually about, what the theme is, what the focus is. And so what we've done, or what I've done, is try to cluster those themes and look for standout themes in what has got commissioned over the last few months uh, and try to pull four out. So what's hot with commissioners right now? And this is necessarily subjective because it's literally me looking and thinking that looks like a cluster. Well, here are a few that stood out. China. Simply documentaries about China. And actually, it's obvious the BBC is doing a lot in China. The BBC is co-producing a lot with streamers in China, like Tencent. And the Chinese streaming platforms are also heavily involved in documentary commissioning. So Tencent was a partner on Blue Planet, for example. And so making documentary about China is a great way to get that content sold into that market and also has an international opportunity. Gender and <coughs> gender identity is another one that stood out, so a right, right on trend topic, very um, at the fore in terms of not just documentary but also drama and other types of content. But looking at gender identity was another cluster that stood out. Another on-trend topic, strong women, brackets, all species. Now, I say that because nature documentary about female animals leading packs, etc., is another way to think about strong women. It doesn't, doesn't have to be human beings, and we've picked up things like Quibi's Fierce Queens, for example, is an example of that. And music was another one that stood out. And I think this is partly driven by streamers as well, um, looking at topics that are perhaps have possibly been underserved and also will appeal to their core younger demographic. Music documentaries, a big, big cluster of those that I picked up in that forward commissioning. And then the other key themes that stood out, um, smaller cl clusters, politics and society, youth culture, particularly with regard to mental health, so things like the impact of social um, media on the, on the mental health of young people and how they engage with society and, and their peers, sustainability in the environment and race. So those were the key themes that we picked out of our commissioning database. And with that, um, there is my email address that I promised you. So take a photo of this slide, send me an email, and I will happily share the slides. Uh, and otherwise, I'll take questions in a minute. Simon's going to have a chat with me. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, what? <laughs> a lot of information there. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And there's much more where that came from. It's, uh, it's, an, <laughs> it's an increasingly um, complicated landscape. I mean, a couple of, uh, I mean, there's, there's, there's lots to drill down into, and I'm sure you all will have questions, and we'll, we'll open this up in, in, in just a little bit. Um, I, I come from a public broadcasting background, and um, uh, one of the concerns about, uh, from the public broadcasting world was the aging of the audience 
and it's really interesting to see that the growth in the audience um, <coughs> so dramatically in those older um, segments of society. What what do you think is is driving that? What's um yeah, so, so growth, of course, is a relative measure, and, and the reason the growth is so stark among that older age group is because the younger population is already saturated. They already have SVOD, mm -hmm. so their growth is, and their growth potential to take it is low, whereas the older demographic traditionally has not taken SVOD, so their, it, their growth is strong. But, you know, what's more interesting is the fact that we can, it's reflected in the forward commissioning now of the streaming players. So famously, you know, it's a, possibly an urban myth to what degree they use customer data in their forward commissioning, but we can certainly see that they are responding with more period drama, with more crime drama, with more documentary, with more factual. Um, so I think that's a, a reflection of that they've recognised how important that growth demographic is for them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, you you um, helped give us uh, some information around how these quotas are um, uh, going to be taking shape in, in uh, the industry, particularly in the European marketplace. Um, coming from North America, I've been watching this from a distance and um, I wonder if you could drill into a little bit more how you predict that is going to play out in the marketplace. Um, is this going to be, you, you know, the pan-European licensing model where they're trying to try to, do you think, fill those quotas um, through that strategy or will be looking more regionally or and, and how do you see the regulators beginning to um, shape what the, the rules of the road look like there? Yeah, well, there's, there's lots of moving parts in that. Um, of course, as we've seen, the, the, the big US studios are about to remove a load of US content, which is going to help quota, and, and that wasn't accounted for in the calculation. If 20% of the catalog is at risk and of US origin, potentially <laughs> that gets them down to quota pretty quickly. Of course, it won't work quite like that. Um, what, what they will do, and they've, Netflix in particular has been doing anyway, is, is removing long tail content. A lot of the older um, catalog and archive that traditionally maybe five, eight years ago was bread and butter for streamers is now going into the AVOD space, the advertising supported space, and reducing on, on platforms like Netflix. Again, a lot of that was US origin, so that's having an impact. Um, so simply removing US content is one. Obviously buying some more European content is another. Increasing pan-regional licensing of European content is another. And all of those will be going on. And simply reducing total catalog size is, is a fifth way. Um, one of the factors that I think is interesting of that quota regulation, which I suspect is possibly an unintended factor, is regulators are making global platforms more competitive with local European streamers. They are forcing them to be more competitive because local content is often a competitive edge. So they will accelerate a process that anyway was underway um, and anyway is, is the traditional sort of evolution that we've seen in the television industry prior to streaming existing, that channels begin to localize, they start with acquired US, and then they begin to localize. So lots of different things going on. And, and do you expect, um, uh, well, I, I guess a, a question which I have for you is kind of stepping back and looking at the business as a whole. Um, as we're moving into this um, kind of new era with all these competitors, with these quotas in place, um, uh, in the documentary space, do you see the trend towards commissioning projects um, from the start? Because you're tracking a lot of projects, obviously. Or is this, you know, the the these um, uh, streamers coming in, you know, looking at finished work, where the you know burden of production is still on the independents, and then they're acquiring the the global licenses. Yeah. 
So we, you know, we, we tend to focus on the original production. A lot of the, if you read the trade press, the focus is all on originals. Um, the reality is the majority of Netflix's content is acquired content, and that goes for all of the other streamers as well. So acquisition is still the big um, segment, but original production is increasingly important. Um, I want to talk a little bit about Disney Plus that just launched in, in the US um, uh, and actually launched in the Netherlands too, I believe. Um, uh, what do you see their impact? You know, the, the market's been dominated by Netflix in the past few years. What do you see as the impact of such a big player coming into the marketplace? They run docs and they're commissioning a lot of original documentary and non-fiction content. Surprisingly, yes. Um, Disney is, is kind of out on a limb in terms of its position in, in the market and its potential impact. If we think about the wider direct-to-consumer push for the studios and we rank them in terms of forcefulness with which they will take an approach to the direct market, I think Disney is out way out there on the top. Um, their, their, mark, their potential impact on the market is huge because they will lead the charge to re-engineer the entire business. Um, I was reading someone left in the back seat of the aeroplane I was on a few weeks ago, a copy of Vanity Fair, which ha had an article about Bob Iger and Steve Jobs. And I hadn't realized until I read that article how far back the drive to go direct goes at Disney. It goes right back to the Pixar acquisition when there was a meeting of minds between those, those two execs. So about 12 plus years there's been a drive at Disney to go direct. I don't think any of the other studios are pushing as hard as Disney. So single out Disney as the lead, the, the pinnacle, the spearhead of re-engineering the entire way that the content production and distribution business works, then the impact is, is huge. I think, I'm not sure if it was in that article, but actually Bob Iger said if Steve Jobs hadn't have died, he, would, he, he was expecting Disney and Apple to become one company. Yeah, and there are still, um, there are still rumors in the market that that may be on the cards, yeah. Um, uh, it does seem that uh, a lot of us have been cutting the cord, right? And we've been cutting the cord and moving to these extra services. We've got our Netflix, we've got our Amazon Prime, and, and now we have these other choices. Uh, at some point, it feels like you're suddenly back up to a high cable bill as to what you, you know, what you were trying to get away from. Um, do you, are you expecting some consolidation in the marketplace with all of these new platforms coming on? So, I think it's really interesting if you've been watching the market as long as I have. What goes around comes around. I guess this goes for everything, fashion, clothes, etc. <laughs> we, we've been here before. Um, and we were here when there was a new disruptor that came along, um, and it was called digital television. And, and if you remember at that time, many markets went from five, ten TV channels to 500, 600, and everyone was terrified about fragmentation and audience drift and what was going to happen. And the solution, of course, was, well, twofold. If you were a channel, you launched different brands to recapture your fragmenting audience. And if you're a platform, you aggregated those brands. So I think we'll see the same in streaming. I think the next big challenge, once we're through this next phase of launch of uh, all the new platforms, is twofold. It's navigation and it's aggregation. Because um, I suppose the one difference between that digital channel burst that we saw in the 90s and, and streaming is that all the streaming platforms have different interfaces. There's no unified grid electronic program guide that we had for, for linear. Um, so the next stage is for someone to aggregate and solve the navigation problem. And interestingly, that's exactly what Apple have said they're trying to do. Because if you um, 
sat in on their rather long and drawn out and self-congratulatory launch eight months ago, or pre-launch actually, not actual launch, um, what they talked about was aggregating, of course Apple TV Plus is the one that people talk about, but that's actually a small number of their own originals, a sort of icing on the cake. More fundamental was the aggregation of lots of other streaming platforms and even pay TV services, so you can subscribe to Comcast and Direct TV through the Apple platform. The one thing that Apple is very good at is making complex things work simply, and I think if they can solve that, it will go some way to addressing the problem you highlight. Um, spend, you know, that, that incredibly high spend is a particularly US phenomenon and the, the level of cord cutting you know that we've seen in the US is unprecedented and not not replicated anywhere else mm -hmm. so I think there are differences between markets in the tolerance of price points but you know we, we've been here before there are ways out there to solve the problems mm -hmm. packaging bundling is one way navigation has to follow um, and I think it will become less of a problem as we move forward. Yeah, I mean, I've been looking at this piece in the Hollywood Reporter last week, um, you know, according to a, a survey they did, um, or was done by um, uh, Morning Consult, uh, they found that the kind of sweet spot, you know, price point for consumers was around $21 a month, so you're essentially limiting yourself to two, maybe three services out of all these services. It's an interesting price point because that's about the average pay TV spend in Europe um, as a whole. Um, but of course it was much higher in the US. It's about $90 in the US. Um, and I suspect that um, there will be some dollars burning some holes in some pockets once they've cut the cord and got Netflix, Amazon and Hulu and HBO and you know there'll be a, f a few more dollars for, some, for the others as well. Um, I was um, surprised in the presentation to um, when you were talking about who's commissioning uh, still to see uh, the uh, public broadcasters so high up on, on the charts there for documentary content. Looking forward, um, how do you see that trend um, uh, as you look into the future? How, how do you see the, the space for, for public broadcasters, also the kind of public broadcasters slash streamer, you know, because they're doing both now, right? Yeah, I, I think it will be a sustained trend. Um, you know, it's been it's been a sustained trend for some time. Um, often, or it's not often, but quite sometimes they're working with the streaming players in co-production. So I mentioned the BBC has been active in China. BBC also does a lot of co-production with Netflix, more around drama, but the European broadcasters in particular are much stronger commissioners of factual and unscripted, and they're much bigger co-producers than the US networks, um, and I can't see that changing, and the streamers will continue to drive as well. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so Quibi is a new uh, uh, platform that's going to be launched in uh, in the springtime, I believe, yeah. of, of 2020. Um, I've been trying to figure out what it is they're doing. Um, they have a lot of money. They raised over a billion dollars in, in capital. Um, can you shed any light on, on <laughs> what? Yeah, because they, they were one of the ones you mentioned as, as, as commissioning a lot, of, a lot of new content. Yeah, it's, it's really hard to say because it's another... Uh, I, I, I don't want to say leap into the dark. In, in one respect it is. Of course people have tried to crack short form monetization in the past and failed dismally. Um, all I would say is there aren't many people willing to bet against Katzenberg. Beyond that, other than what we know about it being short form and mobile only, etc. Um, there's not much more to say until we have more clarity on, uh, on the launch. Mm -hmm. Do you have a sense of um, uh, on, on the, the work they're commissioning? What, you know, you, you had all of your kind of standout themes. Where are they 
Um, do you have a sense of where they are in terms of the thematic focus of, of work? Or? I think it's safe to say that they're focused on a youth audience, as you'd expect. But beyond that, um, you know, the mix is drama and factual and entertainment as anybody, as, a, as any other broad platform. Mm -hmm. So actually what it's not, what we see with YouTube, for example, is a very strong skew to comedy and um, Snapchat a very strong skew to reality and Facebook a very strong skew to factual type of documentary type content. There's not such a strong uh, skew with Quibi, so it is more of a generalist platform. So with those, those, more, with those social platforms like YouTube and Facebook and, uh, and, um, and Snapchat and others, um, uh, with the... I, I, what I've just been trying to figure out is how they're working with independents. Um, are, are they um, uh, acquiring is it mostly an acquisition business for them, or is it a commissioning of original, or combination? My, my, my understanding is it's mostly commissioning, uh -huh. because especially for Quibi, which is going out, you know, and and forging a new market segment, mm -hmm. effectively, although it has been tried before. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And what um, in terms of the kind of thematic. Um, uh, focus. You you gave us like a you know a list of you know um, you know themes which uh, seem to you know have, have kind of a greater stickiness for um, uh, for some of these platforms. How is that being? How are you measuring that? How are you um, uh, over what what kind of period of time are you looking at to see? Okay. Because that's got to, uh, I imagine, kind of go up and down depending. Yeah. So, firstly, I'd I'd say that it was m much more difficult to do for documentary than it is for drama, for example. Because what what I'm effectively doing is looking at the basket of titles that we're aware of that are currently in production or development and looking for clusters. And in drama big clusters drop out fairly simply. In documentary, when I sat down to do it, I thought, oh my God, it's very difficult because it's so diverse what's getting made in terms of documentary. And so they were smaller clusters than I experienced when I did the same exercise for drama. But basically, it's everything that we've picked up that's been commissioned and has yet to go on air. So it's effectively an 18 months to two year window and basket of titles of what's got commissioned recently. Mm -hmm. um, and those were the themes that seemed to drop out. Mm -hmm. But it is subjective, you know, it, there are other themes in there, of course. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, you work in a, in a, in a business which um, uh, does a lot of data analysis uh, and um, uh, and using that data to predict, somewhat predict the future. Um, um, can you, looking forward, say, I think, you know, based on our, our historical um, understanding, these are likely to be themes that will continue, or you think there will be other things that, that, will, that will begin to rise to the top? You know, as, as you know, producers are increasingly looking at you know, kind of what work they're going to be doing as they move forward. Yeah, well, I, I think um, gender and identity is is one that has legs. I think um, do documentaries that appeal to a younger audience, in particular, has legs. So things like music. Um, I think politics is a strong one, and questions around um, what's happening in the wider world, in you know, as we're seeing in the U.S. and the U.K. and other countries in Europe as well rises in extremism, uh, fake news, the way that um, social media impacts society. So all of those themes, I suspect, will continue for the near future to be important themes. Mm -hmm. um, uh, let me just see here, sorry. Uh, I just lost my, my next note here. Um, uh, in terms of kind of other new platforms that we're not 
thinking about that would be acquiring content, you know, you know, with the, the, the social media platforms getting into the content business, although they don't consider themselves content producers, and not quite sure why they consider themselves. Um, what other uh, and, and the ad-driven um, uh, platforms like Peacock coming in. Um, what other spaces do you think are going to be opening up for for uh, documentary stories? So uh, you, you mentioned it yourself. Um, AVOD, uh, ad supported, is is the next frontier, I guess. Um, the streaming market to date and the changes and we've been talking about have largely been driven by paid for paid platforms, subscription platforms. H Hulu has shown how successful a hybrid model can be. So Hulu is um, majority now ad supported customers. Mm -hmm. They're not entirely free because they just pay a lower subscription fee, but it's been very successful. Um, and when Disney creates its bundle, because one of the things we haven't talked about, mm. again, Disney Plus is just one part of the Disney strategy. The wider strategy is to bundle Hulu, ad-supported tier, and ESPN Plus, the sports platform, into a super mega streaming and package. And yeah. Pixar and Marvel Studios and... Yeah, so and that... And they're, and they're, then they're doing documentary content under all of those different brands. I was surprised um, when we did an event with Disney a few weeks ago in, in LA, um, you know, under under Marvel Studios, they're commissioning uh, documentary content. Yeah, absolutely. And that's why Disney Plus was on that chart as one of the top commissioners of documentary at the moment. But what that bundle is and represents is a hybrid model. So we've moved from pure subscription driven in the streaming market to hybrid where it's a mix of models and increasingly we're um, moving to exploration of entirely ad supported platforms like Tubi for example. Um, primarily at the moment mining deep archive so uh, when I was sitting down with a few distributors at MIP a few weeks ago they were saying stuff we, we thought would sit in the catalogue unloved for, for the rest of our lives is suddenly finding a market in the AVOD space. So it's not new stuff, they're not commissioning, but they're buying a lot of really old stuff to go on those AVOD platforms. And of course the next step will be, how, once everyone's doing that, how do you competitively differentiate? You start to commission or you start to co-produce, or you start to finance original stuff. So that will be another wave that's probably on the horizon two or three years out from now, when the AVOD players start to move beyond deep archive. So uh, mining that deep archive is really an opportunity for producers and sales agents and others who have um, an archive of films which may have been previously commissioned by a public broadcaster that the license has now expired to bring those pro uh, product back into the market. Yeah, absolutely, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I think that will be a big, a big trend uh, in the next couple of years. Interesting. Um, in terms of, um, uh, uh, I was surprised to see how underweight Germany is. You know, think of all the kind of great um, uh, German producers and directors who I know and um, uh, uh, and that being the largest um, um, single market in Europe. Um, what, what do you think accounts for that and how do you see that trend shifting? It's interesting given that, you know, the, the, there were 23 Netflix originals on that chart for Germany. Um, there have been other breakout hits, um, Deutschland 83, 86, um, um, was my, my favourite, the name of which now escapes me, set in just before the war, Babylon Berlin. Um, uh, you know, and, and just that we're sitting here talking about German drama going international. Imagine that ten years ago, you know, if you, if you made something in German language, you knew you'd sell it to Germany, Austria and Switzerland and that would pretty much be it, especially drama. And now that's fundamentally changed, but 
still it's German language and obviously it doesn't travel quite as well as some other languages. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But nonetheless it's become yeah, a very important market and some great production coming out of Germany. How do you see those um, uh, projects performing outside? Because, you know, if, with Deutsch, uh, uh, this is a fiction series, obviously, Deutschland, mm. but with, with documentary too. But, um, uh, how do you see the language barrier um, translating across different countries? If you, you talked about Spanish <laughs> content also having a market in, in the United States or Spanish language content. Um, uh, is there, um, are you seeing opportunities for that work really to grab a global audience despite any language challenges? I think we've seen a fundamental shift in how non-English language can travel and that's also been driven by the streaming players. Um, and of course it varies by country and, and what you're, you want and are used to in terms of localization, for example, whether you're a dubbing market, a subtitling market, or even in much of Central Europe where one man does all the voices. But that, if that's what you're used to, that's what you want. I, I can't bear to watch dubbed content, but if you're in Germany, of course, you watch dubbed content. But Netflix has fundamentally shifted that demand Yes, it varies by country, the tolerances vary, but I think it's a, another fundamental shift that non-English content can now travel much more than we would have expected it's 10 years ago. Because the fear, or the old fear on the, on the public broadcasting side was we can't have too many subtitled projects, and, um, but now we're seeing that being reversed. Yeah, absolutely. That's great. Yeah. Um, I want to um, open this, we, we have, uh, but about 15 or 20 minutes left. I want to open this up to all of you. I gave you your homework at the start of the session to come up with uh, questions for Guy in here. And there's a lot of a lot of data in there that we've barely scratched the surface of. So there is going to be a microphone going around. I'm going to go to that gentleman in the back here who was his first to raise his hands. And maybe we can raise the house lights a little bit so I can see the audience. Um, yeah, hi there. That was fantastic. Um, okay. I run, uh, I run FilmDo, which is one of the platforms that you mentioned. We're actually transitioning to AVOD. Um, completely agree with what you said. So question, which platforms do you think are going to make that move to AVOD? And uh, I know you mentioned, well, you mentioned the price point, but um, do you, you know, how, do you see, how do you see those platforms working? And also in relation to Linear, I, I don't know if you mentioned Linear, but Linear on IPTV. So I wondered how much you think Linear and IPTV may also start to impact Europe as well as, as the AVOD transitions. Uh, when, you, when you say Linear, in what, what aspect? Uh, I mean like on, on TiVo and Roku, those kind of continuous... Oh, yeah. 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 Um, <sighs> let, let me tell you who I think won't go AVOD, and that's Netflix, because there's a lot of talk about Netflix potentially experimenting, etc. Beyond Netflix, I suspect AVOD as part of the mix will become increasingly common. So we know that NBC is going to do some. We know, of course, Hulu will be rolled out internationally. Um, but beyond uh, the vi visibility we have today of who's experimenting with AVOD, all I can say, you know, I can't nail down specific brands, but I, I just think it will be a trend that spreads across multiple brands, either wholly AVOD or as part of the business mix. The linear, the sort of TV channel, etc., is just a variation on AVOD, I think. I don't think it fundamentally shifts the, ma the market in any way. Um, it's just a variation. Thank you. So um, this, these figures for the, the social media uh, documentary stuff, 35% of YouTube, does that count like beauty videos and unboxing videos and stuff like that? So these are originals. So they're not the sort of user gen stuff. These are original commissions. Um, well, the mic goes up to this gentleman with his arm up. Um, the one thing we didn't talk about was how you see um, this increased competition 
and particularly for European uh, content and with the um, uh, uh, new quarters um, coming into uh, coming into place, how you see that affecting the, co the, the licensing fees that these um, all these outlets were going to have to be paying. Uh, there's, been, there's obviously more competition yeah. uh, for content. Do you see that having a, a positive trend on licensing fees? Is that something you track? Um, we we don't track actual money changing hands, but you know certainly the it should be positive because, as I said in one of the slides, the, obviously the relative importance goes up significantly. We we did some analysis recently, not on documentary, but on box office for independence, and the huge skew, of course, when D Disney pulls its movies, of how much of the cin uh, Box, 2019 box office Disney will control. The impact of that is that smaller studios like Sony, Paramount, etc., suddenly account for instead of 7% of box office on streaming platforms, 23% of box office. So that gives you a relative shift um, of that change, and we'd expect a similar impact on you know, non-movie content, that the relative importance and therefore the value should rise. Um, in with, with licensing as a whole, uh, another thing that I was chatting about a few weeks ago at MIP was how the contracts are changing mm -hmm. in respect that they're shorter, they're more likely to be non-exclusive. Um, and, and that, of course, ha and, and of course, everyone wants extended catch-up, etc. So all of those moving parts have an impact on value. Where you take away with one non-exclusive versus exclusive, maybe you gain on the extent extent of the catch-up and add-on rights that are incorporated into the contract. So that's, that's potentially a positive trend for independence. It should be a positive trend for independence. Yeah, I mean, the whole direct shift really should be, a, a, for the smaller studios and the independents, should be a positive. And AVOD is the icing on the cake because that allows monetization of archive. Yes, uh, I think the mic went off to the back here. Yeah, hello, thank you. Um, I was wondering, uh, as the landscape of how we consume film and content is changing, also, how to advertise is changing. So I was wondering, what's your take on branded content and in general connected to that, how the advertising world is maybe getting more and more influenced or if, uh, yeah, influenced by the actual con consuming of content? Um, so the content around content. So, so one of the interesting things, and I won't credit this to myself, I was at a conference two weeks ago where we were talking actually about advertising on Netflix and someone who knows very well said they don't carry advertising but the amount of product placement you would not believe. <laughs> so actually they are generating um, income from branded brands and branded content if you like. Um, beyond that, digital studio output Social influencers, influencer platforms are where most of the activity we're seeing in branded content is. Um, but it's it's a it's a much bigger and more dynamic market than it was due to both what's going on on Netflix and other platforms with product and the the booming digital studio space where everyone is struggling to to find a business model that succeeds. Branded content is one of the models um, that gets you some way to success, although the report we've just put out on digital studios suggests that almost no one is making it work particularly well. Interesting. I mean, th there has been, this is always kind of an ethically murky space in the documentary world, obviously, with uh, um, uh, having, having brands involved um, and, uh, you know, Airbnb, uh, uh, completely financed the a film this past year, year, Gate Chorus Deep South, and um, I think it's going to be just increasingly a challenge in, in the dark space for how to, how to work with brands but yet keep something 
um, uh, completely independent. Yeah, and it's also a um, factor of the shifting, you know, the shift of advertising away from linear and how, how and also advertising targeting and how you address that notoriously difficult youth audience in terms of getting brand and, and advertising messages across to them. All of those shifts are uh, influencing the upswing in branded content, the uh, upswing in the use of influencer networks, the upswing in the, the sort of concept of fan bases as a monetizable um, concept. So a lot of shifts going on. And again, driven by the fundamental shift to streaming and to online away from the more traditional platforms. Although we must say for any linear broadcasters in the audience, clearly that is still a very strong space revenue-wise, not growing particularly, but still very strong revenue-wise and, and seen as probably still the best way to initially build a brand because of the breadth of the audience reach and the fact that you don't actually know among the massive audience they reach who really is going to be interested or not when you're building a brand. So too much targeting can be a bad thing as well. Yes, right in the middle there. Could you say something about um, how you think this um, uh, shift in demogra demographics of the <coughs> streaming services, how will that affect the traditional public broadcasters and, and their streaming services and, and yeah, in the short and long term? Yeah, I think um, more fundamental than that is the, the whole streaming shift and how that affects the broadcasters and linear channels and the fact that clearly they have to um, make fairly significant moves to recapture a, dri a drifting audience, which they are doing, but possibly they haven't done to the extent they should to date. So fundamentally it affects them in respect that they need strategies to engage both the youth audience and to retain their classically core older audience. Um, and I think that the, the way to do that is to augment their catch-up platforms explore hybrid business models, look at subscription alongside ad-supported broadcaster video on demand, etc., etc. But in terms of the programming, um, you know, not, not particularly a fundamental shift in, say, their commissioning strategy or their, their content acquisition strategy, just in the way that they think about delivering it, getting people onto platform, experimenting with scheduling and box sets, etc. All of those are something they need to do much more of. Yes, sir. White yeah. Sorry. Hi. Uh, I actually have the question that we're currently in the interesting transition phase of not only having content uh, creators or licenses, uh, license uh, holders like studios competing in the. Uh, streaming wars, but also uh, tech companies. You mentioned shortly Apple is going in there and um, there are some other players like Amazon is pretty much a shopping center and the streaming is just a cherry on top. So how do you, how do you see the, the progression of these big cash heavy tech giants getting into the content business and how they might be in a better position to survive this streaming war in a way? Yeah, you're right. I think a lot of them are in a better position simply because it's not their core business. I mean, um, Netflix is a pure play. It's effectively a studio and content distribution business. And whereas Amazon, of course, is fundamentally a retail business, Apple, at least for now, fundamentally a device business, etc. So you're right. They are better protected and potentially better able to survive. Um, a, a prolonged battle and war. Um, but the flip side of that is that they don't dive as deeply into content. So we've seen with Apple a lot of noise about Apple TV+, Plus, but actually not that many shows. And they're not going out and acquiring. They're using Apple TV+, Plus just for a few very high-value originals. 
very different strategy from Netflix. So the way they approach the market, and, and one of the ways I look at this is to plot, is an interesting way to do it. You simply plot the revenue pie of these big companies, and it works for the studios, because you know Warner has AT&T as a parent, NBC has Comcast as a parent. Plot their revenue pie and see where the money com comes from, because he who pays the piper calls the tune. And, and you can then sort of start to um, define what their strategy is likely to be. So Apple, for example, is going to be strongly related to devices and the Apple device ecosystem. Amazon continues to be strongly related to its retail operation um, and other tech companies similarly. Even AT&T, Time Warner, you know, they're in the telco business fundamentally. Warner Media is a tiny segment in that company's pie. So when we think about the tech players and, and, and indeed any non-pure play content business, that's a great way to look at the market and think about um, who, who's paying the piper. Interesting. I was talking to someone on the inside of Apple, uh, on the content side, um, not too long ago, and I was asking him, so what's your strategy in the non-fiction non space? And, um, and he or she said, I wouldn't say who, um, we have no idea. <laughs> trying to figure it out. Um, Shifting, shifting around there. Yes, sir. Hi. Um, you mentioned that the millennials are the generation that are using SVOD, um, or the majority. Um, would you say that the generation after them are the YouTube generation? And what would you see as happening? Those people who have become addicted to YouTube, the, the teenagers, the young ones, they will perhaps stay with that and not want to go to any streaming service and they'll look to YouTube for their, for their entertainment. Would you say that's true or would you see them as shifting? Well, I think that's what Katzenberg is betting on with Quibi, that the short form and the non-big screen delivery will, will rise um, thanks to that generation in particular. I've always been slightly allergic to saying um, this is what young people do, therefore this is what they will do when they're 40, because I know when I was young, um, and uh, you know, I, I remember being on holiday in Malia where we went every year, a, a, a sort of fun resort in Greece, saying to my group of friends, we will be doing this when we're 40. Strangely, <laughs> we weren't doing that when we were 40. So fundamentally what I'm trying to say is, there's always a shift. Um, I think that the shift is, is fairly fundamental and much of that behavior will be carried forward, but not all of it. And we, we've seen with the millennials, as they get into their 30s and heading towards 40, that they do begin to certainly take Netflix, certainly take pay TV, um, use the big screen. Um, their content preferences shift as they age. So. Well, I, I guess the conclusion is some of the behaviour will continue, but they will trend also towards that more lying on the sofa in front of the big screen behaviour as well. But, but don't you think that YouTube will, you know, is, is catering for that? You can watch YouTube on your big screen on your sofa and... Yes, um, you can. You have a tremendous variety of content. You, 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 right you can, but, you know, young people are also very engaged with drama. They're also very engaged with, um, uh, what's the ITV show that's the massive hit, Love Island. You know, so th they are, and for, for that, they are watching live and they are going to, often to the big screen. So, yes, it's a, it's a mix. It will be a mix going forward. But YouTube will continue to be important in those young people's lives, I'm sure the people who are that generation today. Um, let's bring the mic down here in the front and then we'll go over here. Um, uh, before let's moving down. Um, for Quibi, is, is, are they launching globally? Do you, do you know of, or is it just in... Well, I think initially, yeah, like all of the players, that it will be US, but yes, ultimately. 
Um, you mentioned that Edward is uh, digging deep into the archives. Are they digging as deep as SD uh, content is of interest again? And, and second question, uh, is piracy dead? <laughs> so for the AVOD players, the format that they're purchasing, whether they're purchasing standard def, I don't know. So I don't know the answer to that. I suspect not. Um, is piracy dead? No, but there has been something of a shift. And actually, piracy is interesting um, in respect that it, it, it's actually quite demographically skewed. Maybe it's not a surprise to everyone, but it's skewed male. It's skewed to actually lower income groups, and it's skewed to a very specific genre interests, like sci-fi and action, which fits the demographic. I think piracy is becoming less of a problem as more AVOD um, becomes available and more a a adoption of streaming SVOD as well among that typical demographic that's skewed towards piracy occurs. But it's, a, it's an ever-present issue, particularly in some geography, so it's certainly not dead. <clears throat> um, thank you, very lucid and, and helpful. Um, most of your data analysis seems to be drawn from the larger domestic or multinational players in the VOD space. Do you see anything interesting happening in terms of you know, smaller independent curatorial spaces there? Uh, any interesting models, uh, any emergent data? Um, that would be useful too. Yeah, um, so I focus on Netflix and, that, and Amazon and Hulu and others because that's what people are obsessed with. But we, we absolutely track a lot of the smaller local and niche players as well. Um, there's a lot of interesting things going on out there. Um, one of the, actually the first people we worked with has recently launched um, Royal, Royal TV streaming, for example, which I thought, what a ridiculous idea. <laughs> but it's been hugely successful. Has got on-platform deals with Comcast and some of the big US operators and has just raised millions to go international. So there's a, the, the interesting thing about niche is that you can do it, you can run a business quite cheaply with very few staff and low, low content acquisition costs if you get the niche right. Where the risk is, is actually in the middle. You've got the very big players, the very tiny players, maybe gardening TV, royal TV, who find their niche and make a successful business. The difficulty will be in the mid-tier, where the competition will be ferocious. And, and if there's going to be consolidation, that's probably where I'd see it happening. But in terms of interesting business models, yes, it's finding a niche that that's, has enough scale to sustain what doesn't have to be a high high cost content acquisition strategy. Any final questions for the guy? Yes. Um, I wonder, do you have any insight on uh, serial content versus one-offs uh, concerning documentary? Uh, we do, because we track um, one-off or movie length or feature length versus serial. Because I didn't do the analysis, though, I can't give you the answer right now. <laughs> but it's in our database. It's Next year. <laughs> um, any, any final um, thoughts to you have a, a room full of documentary professionals, sales folks, producers? Um, words of, of wisdom to them as they move into this kind of shift, seismic shifting marketplace? Um. Yeah, I, th I think cause I'm a great believer in just um, taking a step back and looking back in history because I think a lot of the challenges that we're facing today or the industry is facing today, we have been here before. And sometimes you don't have to reinvent the wheel. Um, the business models are alre have already been solved. All, we, all you really have to do is think about um, how the new positions 
in respect of the old um, and where the similarities lie and how the problems were solved in the past and a lot of the answers are out there. Well, I want to thank you for such a, a, thorough, a thorough presentation, um, uh, all the work that went into it. Thank you all for, for being here today. Thank you. Um, thank you. Thank you.